Okay, good day, people. Hope everyone is well. I'm going to try to do a shout out to a, a scholar who I've been reading a lot of lately, and it's Lynn Margulis or Margellis. I'm not sure how that's pronounced, but she was married to Carl Sagan and their son, Dorian Sagan, and she have written a good number of books together. Absolutely fascinating. This one here that I have is called What is Life? There's another one here called Symbiotic Planet. She's got many books. The, the I guess, Origin of Sex. She's done a lot of stuff on that. She's also done a lot of stuff on the eukaryote invasion. And I'm going to see if I can't try to talk a little bit about grand questions of what is life and the the early nature of life. And I think it's some of this is a critique and an assault on uh, somewhat simplistic Darwinian notions of evolution. And I mean, the simplest way to say the argument is that the radical changes in forms of life on the planet weren't through, um, I guess, the transmission of particular genes or through natural selection, but they were through a kind of symbiogenesis where symbionts would join together and introduce new orders of complexity that were previously not there. And the simplest, you know, scale to look at would be the origin of fungi and plants and animals out of bacteria and protocysts and the kinds of things that, that preceded what we can see with the naked eye. Some of the radical claims, let me just see if I can give some of the radical claims that um, Margulis gives, and maybe this will encourage some people to look at the book, and I'll see if I can maybe generate some more discussion out of that. But, you know, p part of the claim is that, you know, the way we think about life is perhaps really problematic. We have a tendency to think that oxygen is, I guess, conducive to life or natural for life, and that we, we think of things that use oxygen in some way to be um, I guess what we mean by life, and that's really not the case at all, that there were certain kinds of bacteria that ended up producing oxygen that took hundreds of millions of years for subsequent kinds of bacteria to first at night and then eventually find that oxygen hospitable and to be able to tolerate that. But what's interesting is that there still are remnants of those conditions in your body. So for example, when you're sitting here right now and you're breathing, you're breathing in oxygen and there's mitochondria in your cell and they, you know, use ATP and they produce sugars and there's all this, you know, basically metabolizing of the oxygen to produce energy for your body. But when you start to work out hard, when you really get engaged in something, a different metabolism kicks in. It's an anaerobic metabolism and the, I guess the, the kind of system that as anaerobic, it's, it finds oxygen toxic. And to that extent, it really is a kind of metabolism that finds its roots all the way back hundreds of millions of years into the early beginning of, of life. And you still have that in your body. You still have that in your body. And let's see some of the more radical claims. And there are more radical claims than that even. Yeah, that in your, your stomach, in many regards, it, it, has, it has some of the environmental conditions, or it, it's similar to the environmental conditions of the earth hundreds of millions of years ago. It's crazy to, to really think about that. Another really crazy claim, and you want, to, you want to understand this, that the earliest forms of life, the kinds of early, we'll call them er bacteria, these sort of basic ground level bacteria, they didn't know death from the inside. That is, there was no necessary lifespan and then a termination built into it. Now, there was certainly extermination and death and the, the possibility of from the outside coming in and, and killing the bacteria. But the bacteria themselves don't have like an ontogenic life cycle. They don't have a natural death built into them. Instead, what happened was 
this proliferation, proliferation and expansion of, of bacteria. And it's interesting as well, bacteria don't have a species. There is no species of bacteria. There's many, many hundreds of thousands of kinds of bacteria. But they're able to, they, they change or exchange genetic material laterally. And so there's no real offspring. We don't want to think of, of bacteria as having like offspring. Okay, so at any rate, when, when you go to this question of when the earliest bacteria were, were reproduce, you know, basically dividing and, and growing and dividing, growing and dividing, and as this is happening, the proliferation created various kinds of, of early conditions. Now, one would be cannibalism, that cannibalism came and neighboring bacteria would devour one another, but it wasn't always successful that in some instances there was a devouring that was unsuccessful and it basically was a swallowing but unable to digest and that became the basis of the nucleated cell. It was the eukaryote invasion in some way. That nucleus and a cell with a nucleus in it, that with the DNA inside it, rather than kind of RNA as ciliates with with cilia as a little plasma around the cell, kind of sharing it openly, right? That that pre DNA, the the kind of RNA instructions that were there outside the cell, shared laterally. And then as the prokaryote, I'm sorry, as the eukaryote invasion happened, a kind of consuming without the ability to digest created the nucleated cell and paved the way for multicellularity. And another thing that happened was as the cannibalism was rising, there was a kind of abortive cannibalism, she says, that resulted in a truce that we call sex. Sex was... I guess, invented as a truce between neighboring bacteria trying to cannibalize on one another. <clears throat> now, with regard to the question of the one that did successfully swallow but unsuccessfully digest and the base of the nucleated cell, a different way to say that, and she says it, it's very provocative here, is that sex and death run together in that death was the first sexually transmitted disease. And what she's saying there is that as, and again, she sort of, I guess it's the first eating, you could say it's the first disease that came from a kind of eating, but eating, sex, and death have this sort of interwoven nature in the early, earliest aspects of life. And that as I guess, well, I guess they're protocysts, but as these early forms of life are, are devouring one another and they swallow one another whole and basically take the genetic material and enclose it into the, you know, you get the, those sort of the cell with the organelles, including the little plasm there that has the DNA in it. Now it's contained and now Death int now death is formally introduced into those multicellular organisms. So you could think of it this way, that there is kind of life per se, and life doesn't have death as a necessity. It doesn't have death built into it. Death comes from without and is imposed upon it. But life itself doesn't really have death for millions of years. And then death becomes incorporated into it through a kind of symbiogenesis where one organism swallows but doesn't digest the other and grabs its genetic and the kind of genetic material in it and then offspring and the notion of offspring, meiosis and mitosis, right? When you get meiosis, whether that's just in plants with flowers or whether you get it in animals, now you have these sort of haploid cells, they get together and then they pass off a little bit from the parents to, you know, in giving the genetic material to their offspring. But that death itself starts to become incorporated into life. And so what you see is that there is life and then death gets introduced into life for the sake of complexifying life. That life can only become more and more complex as those cells become, I guess, willing 
willing to specialize and thereby die. So like, for example, 90% of the brain cells that you have, they have to die by the time you're born, something like this. There's a, there's a huge number and they have to die in order for your organs to become organs. That is, there's a great amount of specialization in multicellularity that depends upon cell death. And the, the strategic cell death at, at timed rates, and it's, you know, according to genetic sequence, it's a kind of way that life incorporated death for expanding its range and scope of, I guess, of, of capacities, of interactions. Also interesting, you know, later in the book, she actually brings up the issue of, of psilocybin mushrooms and how they're related to the Eucharist. And I think it's, it's an interesting claim to suggest that somewhere in the cells of our bodies that there is a kind of ancient, ancient ancestral memory of life without death and the kind of, I guess, regression that can happen in, in certain kinds of states, in maybe near-death experiences, maybe uh, traumatic experiences, but a person, when they have this kind of regression back to this platonic form, some, some notion of, of e eternality, it could be a kind of memory trace down into the cellular level of, of that, that sensibility of life being yet without death. It's, a, it's just radical claims. I mean, she, she also actually claims in the books that the things that we think of as not taking conscious effort are much more, they, they did have a conscious effort, but now it's been sublimated. So, you know, just circulating your blood, breathing, these kinds of things that we just think of as automatic, that, well, they are for us, but for millions of years, they took conscious effort. That at the level of bacteria, while these were growing and developing into multicellularity, there was something like a conscious awareness. And she gives some pretty interesting examples. So if you take a yellow sponge and an orange sponge, I'm talking about a living sponge, and you push them through a, a mesh net that pulverizes them into little pieces, and then they sit in a tank, even though the pieces have been pulverized, eventually those pieces will find each other and if you give it enough time you look you will find a yellow sponge and an orange sponge regathered regrouped and sort of by recognizing each other and having formed back now they've done very similar experiments with hydras and you push a hydra through now hydra is a little more specialized it has um organs and at least rudimentary organs that we can see that give specialization when they push that through it too has some recognition of itself will try to reform but because it doesn't have i guess the ability to with a blueprint coordinate how all the pieces go back together you end up with these odd kind of monstrosities but the more general point is there does seem to be some kind of awareness she even talks about you know bacteria that are building I guess parts of their own body sort of through selecting elements in their environment. You can try to think about the way, you know, a, a hermit crab or the way certain kinds of um, sea life, they pick, you know, shells and aspects of their environment and, and create kind of, I guess, exoskeletons or, or hard bodies for themselves. But that even these things without any nervous system without any brain they seem to exhibit something like a capacity for conscious choice a capacity for discerning selections and i guess i'll just end with i think a lot of this stuff is is it's just absolutely fascinating i think it's controversial i'm sure she's a very controversial figure but i think increasingly her work is probably being substantiated that a lot of this is going to be seen to be more and more the case. I think people are learning a lot more about microbiotics and the very important role that bacteria play. Just I'll leave it one last example. If you were to suddenly vaporize all of the quotes animal cells in your body, 
Okay, we would just do that. We have, create a weapon that just vaporizes them. They disappear, and hanging in air would be a whole zoo of micro uh, bacterial phenomena. You'd have all kinds of microbes and bacteria and certain worms, and I mean, especially in your stomach, that it is filled with a high percentage, more than one would think, a high percentage of material that technically is not you, but it's symbionts throughout which you wouldn't be possible. So please, if people are, I'm sure there are a lot of people on the web here who are, who are just much more knowledgeable about this than I am, please feel free to post comments, uh, give other reference books. I do think that uh, the Margulis stuff is just fantastic. If people haven't checked it out, uh, go check it out. Okay, thanks.